Good evening, welcome. I'm John, I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're pleased to welcome Courtney Softness in support of Spilt Milk, joined by authors Tikira Madden and Mira Jacob this evening. First, a quick overview of webinars for those of you who are just joining us. The chat is closed, but you may wanna keep the chat window open during the event as I will be dropping links to purchase Spilt Milk and other books by our authors this evening from Literati Bookstore. Uh, there is also a link to purchase books in the description right below me if you're watching later on YouTube. And if you're watching live, as a reminder, you can submit questions for the Q&A portion of the event this evening using the Q&A feature of the webinar available to you uh, at any time. And I will read a selection of those questions at the conclusion of the conversation. As a reminder, you can purchase more books at literatibookstore.com to uh, pick up at curbside if you live in Southeast Michigan or to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And in lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming. Whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or maybe this year's subscription to our programming, you can make donations at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, uh, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us from. And now I'll introduce tonight's author and our guests. Courtney Zoffness won the 2018 Sunday Times Short Story Award. Other honors include an Emerging Writer Fellowship from the Center for Fiction, the Arts and Letters Creative Nonfiction Prize, Breadloaf Writers Conference Scholarship, and two residency fellowships from McDowell. Her writing has appeared in various journals and anthologies, including the Paris Review Daily, Long Reads, The Rumpus, and No Tokens. She had notable essays in Best American Essays 2018 and 2019. Courtney holds graduate degrees from Johns Hopkins University and the University of Arizona and a BA from the University of Pennsylvania. She has taught at nearly a dozen institutions, including Yale University and the University of Freiburg. Currently, she directs the creative writing program at Drew University and is a faculty member at Writing Workshops in Greece. She lives with her family in Brooklyn, New York. Her literary debut, Spilt Milk, is out from McSweeney's just this week. T. Kira Madden is a lesbian APIA writer, photographer, and amateur magician living in Hudson Valley in New York. She's the founding editor-in-chief of No Tokens, a magazine of literature and art, and is a 2017 NYSC NYFA Artist Fellow in Nonfiction Literature from the New York Foundation for the Arts. Her debut memoir, Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls, was a New York Times Editor's Choice selection, a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle John Leonard Prize, and a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award for Lesbian Memoir. And Mira Jacob is a novelist, memoirist, illustrator, and cultural critic. Her graphic memoir, Good Talk, a memoir in conversations, was shortlisted for the National Book Critics Circle Award, longlisted for the Penn Open Book Award, named a New York Times Notable Book, as well as Best Book of the Year by Time, Esquire, Publishers Weekly, and Library Journal. It is currently in development as a television series with Film 44. She is currently the visiting professor at MFA creative writing program at the New School and a founding faculty member of the MFA program at Randolph College. She's the co-founder of Pete's Reading Series in Brooklyn where she spent 13 years bringing literary fiction, nonfiction, and poetry to Williamsburg. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband, documentary film filmmaker Jed Rostein, and their son. They can't hear you but they can sense you through the powers of the internet. So please join me in welcoming Mira Jacob, T. Care Madden, and Courtney Softness into your living rooms. I think you have to unmute them. Can you guys unmute yourselves? Uh, no, it's just supposed to be me. Unmuted. Okay. Uh, thank Unmuted. you. Thank you, John. Uh, it is really a pleasure uh, to be at Literati uh, and to be with uh, T. Kira and Mira. Uh, I'm going to read an excerpt from Spilt Milk, which I'm going to show you in the light. It's really glittery and pretty. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and then we're going to have a chat. I'm just going to read a short bit. This is from um, an essay called Hot for Teacher. Hot for Teacher. What did they want more than anything? Violent things, unattainable things. More than anything, she wanted to taste blood, said one student. More than anything, he wanted freedom, said another. Your characters need to have desires, I'd explained in the previous class. Drama arises when people struggle to get what they want. 
their first writing ass assignment of the semester at this public East Coast college, compose a short fictional sketch that begins with wanting. Compelling, complex fiction, I'd said, grows out of desires great and small. Their opening sentences offered proof. More than anything, she wanted a baby. More than anything, he wanted things to return to the way they were. Then we arrived at Charlie in the back row, a pale acne pocked sophomore who rarely participated in class discussions. I'd surmised he was shy, but it was early in the term. I was making assumptions. More than anything, Charlie read in an even voice, he wanted for her to realize that she shouldn't depend on the bankers or lawyers he imagined she dated, that it wasn't them who could really and truly satisfy her, but it was him, a student in her Tuesday writing class, who could and would push aside the pile of ungraded papers and take her passionately atop her desk. Him with whom she belonged in a way that only the romantic poetry she taught them could convey. 20 pairs of eyes pinned me in place. I willed my face not to blush, my voice not to crack. Okay, I said, just as I had to the student who'd shared their work before him. More than anything, I wanted to scream expletives in his face. Charlie's expression was inscrutable. He seemed neither proud nor nervous, perhaps a little expectant, like he'd just ordered takeout and was waiting to be told how much it cost. That passage, I said, has a nice rhythm to it, a nice cadence. I leaned back against the table, my rear precariously close to the pile of ungraded papers. I would not let him have his way with me. That repetition, I said, is poetic. The repetition, I wanted to say, keeps your voice loud while mine is silent. I moved on to the student next to him, one whose character, more than anything, wanted a piece of pie. It is February in Brooklyn and the cafe speakers try to counteract the cult. They blast Southern soul in the form of Joe Tex's I Gotcha, a song I know from the film Reservoir Dogs. I understand the story and its lyrics. It was mine one Friday night in high school when I left a friend's basement to use the upstairs bathroom. The second floor was dark, the house asleep, but I knew the way. When I emerged from the bathroom into the shadowy hallway, her older brother's friend was waiting for the toilet, I assumed. I recognized his football jersey and backward baseball cap, but not the thin-lipped smile he put inches from my face or the pressure of his bony hands on my hips or the way he moved his body from side to side with mine as I tried to dodge him, the entrapment dance. When I retreated backward, he stepped forward until my heel hit the tile at the entrance to the bathroom he was going to push me in there, I realized. He was going to push me onto the cold floor and lock the door behind him and everyone was in the basement and nobody would hear me scream. I tasted iron in the back of my throat. But we're not talking about a dance. We're talking about a song, a groovy horn filled tune whose lyrics describe how a man more than anything wants a woman against her will. See, now there are lyrics that I kind of have to sing. Now kiss me, hold it a long time, hold it. Don't turn it loose now, hold it. See, Kira's dancing. My, my first ever intimate encounter was an unwelcome kiss. I was nine. Todd had advertised his crush on me, told classmates I had a quote, nice ass, crude language that made me giggle. Was I supposed to feel flattered, stung? Todd would later try to retract the comment slipping a sheet of yellow paper into the cave of my school desk, a letter I inexplicably saved. I'm sorry for what I said. You do have a nice ass, but only in One afternoon in the park, Todd announced that he wanted a kiss. Your characters need to have desires. I didn't want to kiss him, nor did I want to be kissed, but the more I refused, the more he insisted until a chase ensued. Just a kiss, he called. I sprinted and screamed, no. Everyone laughed and cheered, cheered him on, including my girlfriends. Terror bloomed in my blood. Drama arises when people struggle to get what they want. I wound up curled face down in the dirt, hands and arms blocking the sides of my face, heart hammering. What was I afraid of? I couldn't have told you then, but I can tell you now. I was afraid of how words we both understood 
leave me alone, suddenly had no effect of how my body didn't belong to me alone. Todd found a sliver of exposed skin between my earlobe and neck and crushed his lips against it. I'm going to stop there. So I think you guys have to unmute, okay. Yeah, got it. Okay, I think you were frozen for a second. Oh, Thank no. you, Courtney. That was a beautiful reading. Um, first of all, I just want to say congratulations. Thank you for having us, Literati. And you're finally here. There's so much to celebrate. You made it. And we're floating in this digital box, but we're here and we're celebrating you. Um, yes, you deserve that. Um, I guess I wanted to start by asking you, for the past couple of years, we've been in conversation about this book, and I feel so fortunate that I've heard about all these different stages of it and different ideas of titles and iterations and essays you were scrapping and essays you were writing. Um, and I remember at some point, something clicked for you, and you thought maybe the title was You Have Violated a Protected Area, which comes in the first piece, right? Yeah. Um, and that line does stay with me since you said that throughout reading as, as this kind of thematic key to the book. So I'm curious for, especially for people in the audience who are maybe building an essay collection or a short story collection, looking for that link. Um, how was this book born? How was it built? How did you find those themes and then grow or evolve the book from there? Could you tell us about just the process of putting this beautiful book together? Sure. Uh, so the book came together um, kind of by accident, which sounds coy. There to sort of make a selection because those were my most current pieces uh, and realized they had a lot of thematic commonalities. Uh, and then I think, um, a right, fellow writer friend accused me of writing a book. And I was like, I think she's right. I think I might be. Uh, and the other pieces I was also working on uh, shared some of those threads in common. Um, the idea of you have violated a protected area was you know, the vocalization on the alarm system uh, from my childhood uh, and also clearly references this book, uh, this book, this essay that I just read from, but it seemed a little too narrow ultimately, and made it seem like uh, a book potentially about, you know, a woman's body, which the book explores, but not um, Courtney, I think we're having some trouble hearing you. A little bit of a glitch, yeah. yeah. Oh no, don't glitch, don't glitch. Can you hear me? Now I can. Uh, <laughs> now you can hear me? You're in and out. My internet connection is on small. In, in and out, <sighs> shit. Um, can you hear me? It wouldn't Thumbs be a book launch. It wouldn't be a book launch <laughs> without this, it's okay. <laughs> One thing you can try possibly for the conversation yeah, uh, to, is it's not ideal, but you can turn off your video and that can save some bandwidth sometimes. Um, or okay. we can try switching back over to the Wi-Fi. I know that that was giving us problems earlier. But... I know, but will it boot everybody off the event if I do that? Nope. Nope. We'll still be here. You will? Yeah. So we can try the Wi-Fi. And if that fails, I think you can just try without... Um, um, video and that can usually okay. sort of save some of the the bandwidth of the the stream for you. Okay, I'm going to turn my video off to answer you, and I'll also secretly be glugging one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm turning my video off. Uh, so I was saying, and give me a thumbs like yeah. up or down if you okay. That uh, that the book came together accidentally. You heard all of that. Yes. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But, oh, I was saying uh, that I was sort of cheating on this fiction project by writing these essays uh, and had initially had you had violated a protected area. You know, the soundtrack of my childhood alarm 
Uh, and, you know, always lovely to wake up in the night to that <laughs> line. Uh, and it clearly could apply to the essay I just excerpted, uh, but womanhood um, to a degree in women's bodies, it is not a book only about that. And um, what I was saying, I think when I cut out earlier was that uh, I, it was hard for me to identify the most I think you're cutting Made out them. again, Courtney. I'm sorry. Oh my gosh. Okay. I, I'm switching internet okay. uh, options. Okay. Yeah, it shouldn't, if you're switching Wi Fi, it shouldn't kick you off. But of course, you oh, it shouldn't. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It shouldn't kick me off. Yeah, you're on. Okay. I'm back. I'm, I never left. And I'm just, <laughs> okay, here, here we're, we're right. all in for it. Okay, so I was to finish this very long, protracted, <laughs> you know, interrupted answer. Uh, it required, I think, other readers, including um, Kira's beloved, Hannah, to help me figure out maybe the most prominent theme. And it was so obvious to me once I landed there. It was like I saw everything, and this is true in my life as well as in the book, through the lens of motherhood after beca I became a mother. So spilt milk really seemed like a much more apt um, reflection of the most prominent theme. Mm. That makes so much sense. Um, I did not get to um, see this book as it was in process. So it just sort of landed on my doorstep like a miracle. Um, and one of it, I'm so glad that you chose to read from that essay because I felt really sort of vindicated and exhilarated when I was reading it the first time because I feel like it's something, I feel like it's part of writing that I've never really seen people talk about. Um, that, well, you know, well, you're talking about a lot of things in it, but specifically where you open it with the student and the kind of the liberty he's taking in that moment um, and the way in which he just sort of both expects you to take it. And I love the line that like he's ordered takeout, you know, and was expecting the price. Like, I love how you sort of delineate that for us. And I was wondering when you were writing that, um, first of all, is that like when you were kind of putting that together, were you at all nervous to write about it? Considering you do still teach, you are still kind of in the public in this very specific way. You have a really prominent role. Was that at all um, any of your consideration in writing about it? I'll leave it there and then I'll ask another question. Yeah, well, you know, the very funny thing about that piece is immediately after it happened, I just like wrote about it. I just barked. I was like, what was that? You know, sort of to try to make sense of it. And then it was sitting idle on my computer for the reasons you've named. I mean, I was, mm -hmm. it's not the institution where I currently teach, but I was sort of like, is this legal? Can I do that? I mean, not literally legal, right. like literally legal. Mm -hmm. uh, is this an appropriate move? Uh, and then um, a friend was putting together an anthology on the Me Too movement and I was invited to submit. Uh, and I was like, oh, I have something because I had not known like what, where to house it. Uh, yeah. And I do feel like that the movement in some ways um, permitted that exploration. Oh, that, makes that makes so much sense. Also, it's really interesting to me that I, I feel like, don't we all have like those essays that and exactly mm -hmm. the question you're asking, like, am I allowed? Is this okay? Is it okay to come out with this? And then something about the world catches up to you. So yeah. I was going to ask you the, the corollary to that was just when you wrote it, because for me, it was really an exhilaration reading that. How did you feel in the course of writing it and having finished it? Did it feel like the, the, the bloodletting I experienced? Did it feel like a relief or was it not that in the writing? Well, I should add, there's like a bit of an addendum that I had written the first two thirds of it. But at that the point I was, you know, this work was solicited. I had become a mother mm. at, of sons. And mm -hmm. so you know, the thread that, you know, I couldn't, you know, sort of submit it without was like, what does it mean to be like raising a boy into a man? Uh, and where, when does this indoctrination begin? And what, if any, control do I have uh, in forestalling 
or preventing it. Uh, and so I think because that piece is still living, you know, I still have sons who I'm, to whom I'm still mom. Uh, it didn't feel like a relief. I mean, I think I, I was glad to be able to amplify this story in a way because it felt like this sort of quiet thing that happened. And then he was removed from my class. And then I taught the rest of the semester and went home. And I was like, oh yeah, I remember that guy. Remember that thing that happened? But it also just seemed to exemplify so much of my like experience in the world. It just seemed to typify like, oh, you think you can get away with that. And, and also you did. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. On that note, I'm, I'm curious, Courtney, all of us write nonfiction about our families and about people we know. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm constantly returning to this question every single day in my work. How do we negotiate doing that? How do we negotiate the power of being the person who gets to tell the story on behalf of others? And I wonder if you have a specific, you know, ethical compass or, or set of rules or questions you ask yourself as you, as you return to the page to write about other people? Yeah, uh, I do. And part of how that ethical compass was formed was through conversations with both of you, <laughs> in part, uh, because uh, part of why it took me so long to write this book, um, or I should say to publish this book, was because I really had a lot of negotiating to do with myself. Uh, and while it may seem like an autobiography, which even good friends of mine have called it, it is a very carefully curated selection of ideas and you know threads of people and myself. And I feel very protective of a lot of my life and others' lives. Uh, and in some way I get that it's, you know, it feels unfair, you know, that I am telling the story, but on the other hand, uh, this is my story, right? So not to sort of put ego in it, I tried really hard to make sure that everyone in this book was um, rendered in a multi-dimensional way. And I, um, I love everyone in this book, except for maybe that dude who, you know, hit on me fast. <laughs> And also that dude at my bat mitzvah who made that anti-Semitic remark, but everyone else. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, I, I worked hard to make sure that uh, even if I had, you know, bad feelings about an incident, that that wasn't sort of coloring my ability to write in many dimensions about someone. Mm. I feel yeah, that I'm reading your work too. Oh, go ahead, yeah. Oh, no, I mean, I, I felt that too when you said that that you loved all of the that there's a way in which you wanted all the characters to be multi-dimensional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, this time it might be Mira, actually. It is. I thought it was me. I was going to turn my video off. No, I think Mira cut out this time. There's like a roving. I like, think so. Internet <laughs> demon. I see that okay. I'm frozen. You want to turn your video off, Mira, to ask? You're unfrozen now. You're unfrozen. I think your cat did it. <laughs> okay. Mira, are you there? I'm back. Okay. Yes, I'm just sorry. I don't know what's happening. Reapparated. Re okay. Um, yeah, just keep drinking. Um, so, Kira, did you hear my question, which was basically asking you the no. same thing? No, I didn't hear it. Okay. Um, I was asking you, I'm going to stop my video too, just for a second, just so um, I don't get frozen. But um, I was asking you the same thing, what your rules were for, for when you wrote. Did you have, because I think that is a really, like, Courtney was saying she wanted to make sure everyone was multidimensional, which I think is a really good barometer to set, you know, like right away. Did yeah. you have that? Yeah, I had the same, the same idea. I wanted to write everyone with dimensionality or light and shadow, as one of my teachers, Joanne, said. Um, 
But, you know, I, I can't say I was successful at doing that with every character. Um, I do think that I push more into fiction if I feel that I can't, that I'm unable to do that in nonfiction, which I'd be so interested to hear from you, Courtney, as a fiction writer as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess uh, a rule I also gave myself was if I asked someone permission, uh, would, that, would that ask be true? If they said no, don't write about me, would I actually not write about them? And if that were true, if it felt more self-serving to relieve myself, um, then I wouldn't ask permission. So there are very few people from whom I asked permission. And instead, um, I did show some people the work and I would say, what do you think of this? Uh, Is this how you remember things? And we'd have a conversation, but I wouldn't say, can I do it or not? I remember you telling me that. Yeah, how about you, Mira? Um, I, you know, I think um, we might have a mentor in common, which is Danny Shapiro. Yeah, I love Danny. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and when I was first talking to her about this, um, she had said to me, you know, I'd said I was going to send it to my in-laws and she was like, why would you do that? Like, why are you, why, what are you (laughs) thinking basically? Um, And and, and she, and her real question was, why would you do that? And I actually had to sit there and ask myself the same question. Why would I do that? Because it is such a um, loaded book and it is about race. Um, mm-hmm. And, and I know in some ways I definitely started the book wanting to communicate with them, but by the time I was finishing it, it was a very different animal. Um, so I, what I ended up doing was I ended up asking myself this question, which I know Kara, you and I have talked about before, which is, are you writing for vindication or clarity? Yes. Right. Yes. Um, and I just had to keep coming back to that. It was my mantra through the whole thing. Um, every time I wrote a scene that I felt was compromising um, or just felt really raw, I would have to kind of ask that question and just sit with it for a while. Mm-hmm. And it really did kind of settle things out for me in this way, because I feel like it's a pretty easy one. Like you kind of know that one. Do you know what I mean? Like you can lie to yourself about a lot of stuff, but that's a pretty hard one to lie to yourself about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. That resonates. Another um, something I keep in mind from the writer Cyrus Grace Dunham in their memoir, um, they say, I realized I had negotiated uh, or compromised truth for legibility, um, that when they came out as trans to their family, they had written it in a very different version because they just wanted someone to understand without actually getting into the complicated, Mm -hmm. thorny truth. And that's something I think about too, like when are we flattening our own work or ideas to please the people that we might show so that they get it rather than making it more complicated and teasing it apart a little bit more. Right. That's such a good question. The email you send versus. (laughs) 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 Absolutely. Um, I was wondering in this collection, Courtney, are, were there, were there pieces that just came to you? I mean, cause it's a very easy read and I don't mean that. I mean, it's just, you're so you land on everything very precisely I feel like it's beautiful it holds me but it also was it was sort of just incredibly I moved through it very quickly and I wondered if there were pieces in it that were harder for you to write than others um if there were ones that like I always wondered you know you just said that there was one that that you sort of came back to and and went from but which piece for you was sort of the hardest either the hardest nail or the one that was most satisfying Um, You know, I feel like hardest in different ways. There were some that were hardest, like sort of psychically and emotionally and others that were hardest struck like formally. Mm -hmm. So I think Holy Body was an essay I care a lot about. I cared a lot about it in in writing it. And I sort of wedded myself to this structure of blessings. And it's sort of like deciding to write formal poetry. It's like, oh, now I'm in this box and I can't get out of this box. Um, But I think the hardest one um, in terms of content was boy in blue because the stakes um, are very high and should be. Am I freezing? No, you're good. Okay, you guys just hold really still. for a second, but I think I got this. Uh, okay. uh, so I think boy in blue was uh, hardest because, in part because the world was changing as I was writing it. And so I was trying to sort of play catch up in revision, but also because it is so easy to, you know, grew up and be an, an ignorant idiot as a white person and as a person, but as a white person. And I really felt, you know, it, I felt, um, you know, beholden to doing a responsible job. Yes. Um, Courtney, were yeah, there, 
were there, I'm curious, I'm always, I feel like I'm always chasing very specific questions as I'm writing non or I, as I'm writing anything, like these questions that obsess me. And I'm curious if there were questions that drove you through beginning and finishing this book or in your work in general. And if there are any questions you want people to leave this book with still carrying. That's a hard one. In part, because <laughs> I think uh, I explore lots of different subjects. Mm -hmm. And I think um, the lens I trained on all of them is motherhood uh, in, in large and small ways, depending. Uh, so I think I chase different questions in different essays. Um, like in the one I read from, you know, it's sort of how to be a mother of boys in a world that encourages certain notions of masculinity and femininity and manhood and womanhood. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were other questions in other essays. Um, in terms of what I want a reader to think about, um, that's also hard. I think is there's somewhat sub subjectivity in a reading experience. Uh, I do think a lot about imperfect parenthood, being an imperfect parents, being the product of imperfect parents uh, and, you know, sort of how to reconcile that uh, so I, that's not really a question, but it's, I think, a thematic, you know, link. Yeah. Well, I love that in the book, you represent that without offering easy solutions. Like this was the issue. This is what I couldn't figure out. And here's how I solved it. And I leave the book feeling that way, like asking the same questions about parenthood. I want, I would love to be a parent one day and how to, you know, how to move through the world as a parent in this new way, how to move through, as you were just saying about boy in blue, an ever-changing world as the world around us shifts, how to have these tough conversations. Like I've learned so much from both of your work in that way. And I look to them as guides. Um, so thank you for that. Well, you're welcome for asking the questions, but having no answers. So good luck. <laughs> but I love that. That's, that's what I want. But anyone that tells you they have the answers, you can't believe them anyway, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I feel wrong. like when I have an answer, the writing falls apart. When I'm trying to offer, this is how it's, this is how you do it. Yeah. Um, there's no more, I don't know. There's no more to dig into. Right. It's, it's too simple. Yeah. Occasion. Um, wait, can I, can I ask you just because you, Carrie, you brought up, um, the, the child aspect, we talked about boundaries in terms of asking people, but specifically with your sons, what, how did you, you know, they're in here, obviously they're all over the pages. How did you talk with them about this book? Did you talk about permission with them? Did you do any of that? I mean, I had my own solutions, but I'm super curious about yeah. yours. Well, they're mostly under five in here. So I think because they were like dependent humans at the time I was writing it, I felt okay putting their likeness on the page, their likenesses. Mm -hmm. um, though, you know, now my oldest is nine. So I ask permission now. Yep. Uh, and, you know, I do think they have a shifting relationship to the work too. Uh, I think, you know, at the beginning when I told my youngest, oh, I'm writing Boy in Blue about how you like to be a police officer. He thought he was famous, he got very excited. You know, he's yeah. still, I mean, now they're sort of, he's kind of indifferent to whatever I do, but my oldest feels, you know, has opinions mm -hmm. and feels. So, you know, I, I am nervous <laughs> and for them to fully read it. Uh, I don't know, I just, I feel like because the sort of permission question was different when I wrote it. So um, true, right. Yeah, I just sort of hope that by the time they're old enough to metabolize it, uh, they sort of understand the impetus. And, you know, I, yeah. yeah. What, what were your guidelines? Oh boy. Um, well, you know, I was using my son's likeness, so I was drawing him. Um, and that made it hard because people could recognize him when we were right. in Brooklyn, which was a little um, intense. And I remember sort of once early on going to a reading with him and somebody saying, oh, you're that kid. Mm -hmm. And he was sort of like, what kid? Like, you know, he had that kind of look on his face. Um, mm -hmm. And another time, because I had written a piece about Michael Jackson and he asked a lot of cute questions, he was six. And then suddenly he was nine and he was out in the world with me. And I, we read another reading once and somebody's like, oh, do that thing, ask the questions to him. 
And it's really, it's like flat monkey. <laughs> yeah. And it was also just hard questions about race that a kid is asking. And it was sort of like, do the funny thing for us. And, um, and I remember having to have a conversation with him where I was like, look, I wrote you in a book and I feel complicated about that. And I also feel like it was the only way I could, could kind of proceed as a parent in this moment of a brown boy. Um, but people are going to, like, you should know that you're never as interesting in my book as you are in real life. <laughs> so like, you don't have to be that kid on the page because that right. kid on the page is just my very shortened version of you. Right. Um, and if anyone ever tells you to perform something from the book, you can just walk away from them. And he was like, like, just walk away. And I was like, yeah, just like, you don't even have to say anything. You can just turn around and walk away. You don't even have to. He's like, that's so rude. And I was like, I know, but you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and it was funny, actually, because at a couple of readings, I saw him do it and he did it. And then he would like, look at me across the room and I'd be like, yeah, that's yes. Just walk away. Um, but I think for, for me, it was really, um, it was important because the book is public in a way that he's not public and because he's little to explain that, that no one can capture him. That's right. right. And I think that was the hardest part of it was feeling like I was, I was limiting who he could be. Um, and also I saw like tabloids in the future of like kid that had great thoughts about race is a racist. You know what I mean? Just like <laughs> the way the internet would turn on him. And I was like, yeah. you're allowed to make your mistakes. I have made so many, I will continue to make many. It was a lot of those talks, which I felt a little before their time, but also I didn't know how not to have them. Right, yes. Yeah. yeah I wish so someone true. told me I could walk away. <laughs> like <laughs> now, I'm right, I'm taking notes right, right now. now. <laughs> Night's the night, you start, walk away. Okay. What did you say right before we started, Courtney? You were like, my, my code word is no. And we were both like, that's so brilliant. <laughs> I got all the answers. <laughs> Everyone, don't forget the Q&A box in the bottom where we're going to switch over to questions soon. So if you have any burning questions, please leave them there. I know you have one great one already. Um, Courtney, uh, a question Melissa Fibos once asked me at an event, which made me really nervous and bashful, but I like the question. Great, thanks. Can you tell us your favorite part of this book? Maybe it's a favorite line, a favorite essay, a favorite moment or paragraph. Compliment yourself for a minute. What are you really proud of? That, that is excited really, about? Um, I can't, I don't think I'd be able to pick a favorite line or moment. Um, <laughs> like, I'm nodding, I'm like, you can, you can. I, I can, can do it. it. No. I mean, I will say in general, and you know, it does feel like you're not supposed to sort of pat yourself on the back. I feel very proud of this book. You know, I worked really hard on it. So I don't know if that's sort of a cheat answer to your question. No, I love, I love to hear the whole thing. <laughs> the whole thing is my favorite thing. <laughs> good. <laughs> good, good, good. Kira, what did you say when you were asked that about your book? Oh, I think I probably blacked out. I was probably too nervous <laughs> by that question. <laughs> but it's such a good question. Also, because I feel like you're, I feel like you're supposed to kind of be like, oh no, none of it, all of it. No, you know what I mean? Like, it's very hard mm -hmm. to kind of focus on a thing. Yeah. Um, but I, I always feel like the parts that are, they aren't even necessarily like the best parts of the book for me, just the ones that are like the hardest one. Do you know what I mean? The ones where like you fought so hard to just get to a place and then you finally got to the place and it may not even be the best case in the book or anything anyone would remark on, but it took you like seven years to get there behind the scenes. Like mm -hmm. those are ones. absolutely. Those are the ones I love. I think I feel the most precious about endings that I found. If I had written my way to a false ending and one very specifically in the book, I remember eating dinner with a group of people and I was, I had to get up from the table because the ending of this very, the most important essay to me came to me <laughs> and that felt really good. And um, the things you fight for too, with an editor, of like it has to be this way. Mm -hmm. um, those, yeah, those stay with me. Mm -hmm. How about I mean, you, Mira? Love that. I love that. I mean, I love that. I love the fight with an editor. Part. I think the thing that I'm most proud about when you asked, I was like, I haven't thought about that. And immediately I knew the answer. So I must have thought about it somewhere in me. Um, the, and there's always, a letter. The question you always wish someone would ask. Yeah, exactly. I was like, oh, I was just waiting. Um, <laughs> thank you. No. Um, but I, I uh, you know, there's a letter that ends the book. It's a letter to my son. And um, 
it took me, I wrote that letter. Uh, I really have 17 versions of it. Um, and that was like, just the, those were just the, the big versions. Like really I had probably 47. Um, and it just, it was like a, it was an emo, it was, I had to do the emotional work to get to the place that I needed to, to write the letter. Mm -hmm. And the first, I would say 27 versions were the meanest, most precise. And like, it was just, it was like, I was writing a letter to my low key racist in-laws through my son. And it felt so good because I was just burning down their house. And it was the opposite of what is vindication it was the opposite of that. It was like, I set everything on fire. You know, it was like nothing. <laughs> and, um, and I had to do that a bunch of times. I had to be as angry as I am like full throttle angry um, until one of my um, one of my writing um, group members, actually four of them sat me down <laughs> and said, um, why are you, yeah, they were, they were like, why uh, is it okay with you that you're yelling at your in-laws through your kid? And I was like, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, and so I guess what I'm, what I'm saying in the long is like, I, it took someone saying that to me. And then I had to like, that I just had to grow. And I just had to do like a lot of like staying awake and like letting myself grow into a different place. And so that piece is the hardest one. Mm -hmm. So that's why I guess I'm most proud of it. Yeah. I think it's the best to have readers who tell you the truth. Yeah. And who know your intentions. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And know when your intentions aren't good intentions. <laughs> <laughs> and now when you're just yep. a bitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you want to should we um do the there's a question in the q a sure yeah um there is a question from the audience and just a reminder to everyone watching that you can submit your questions at any time now is the time to submit them but leah writes hi courtney I've read a few of your essays and was so drawn to them. I'm excited to read the book. I noticed in Spilt Milk and Holy Body, the use of repetition or refrain. How do you think about the use of a kind of chorus, whether in word choice or imagery, in structuring your essay? That is such a beautiful question. Um, thank you for it. Uh, how do I think about repetition? Uh, well, I... Um, care a lot about how writing sounds. So I, you know, to make, to help my own progress, uh, revising and expanding, I read my work aloud. And I think repetition is something that um, helps with rhythm and helps with sound. Uh, and uh, it often is uh, a really helpful guidepost for me in figuring out what's most central um, and uh, ensuring too that the themes I care most about um, sort of excavating are, are clear to the reader. So I think uh, sometimes it can be, you know, heavy handed. I hope it isn't in, in this case. Um, sometimes it can be just sort of a subtle reminder to the reader, like, even though I'm going over here, this is what I really want you to remember and pay attention to. And Jane writes, uh, your writing flows so effortlessly throughout and gives the impression that it's arrived wholly formed on the page. But of course, the process itself is far more complicated. Can you talk about the role research played in the writing of this book? To what degree did research inform, stall, or fundamentally shift the way you were approaching a topic? These are all very professional questions. <laughs> I mean, appreciate them. Uh, so some, um, some essays required more research than other, others. Uh, and there was personal research, you know, like watching my bat mitzvah video multiple times, which I don't recommend for anyone ever, so that I could um, find uh, true details. Uh, I think Mira, you might be frozen again. Am I frozen? You're good. Okay. Uh, and then there was, um, deeper research to write about a mikvah center, I had to learn a lot about um, Judaism because I only am lightly Jewish <laughs> uh, and um, just what that center uh, represents for Jews historically, biblically, traditionally, and now. 
Uh, and then there's an essay in the book um, about um, my son who likes to dress as a police officer. Uh, and I had to do a lot of research in that one, much of which didn't even make it into the essay, which often happens. The history of policing and uh, at one point that essay was far more heavily focused on juvenile offenders. And I went down lots of research holes that took many, many days, weeks, months, who knows. Uh, and a lot of that got cut, but it really informed how I saw the story I wanted to tell and clarified the story I wanted to tell. I wonder if that could open up to maybe a broader question too, as, and maybe when Mira is able to rejoin us as well, um, about the process of what research looks like in, in a memoir, as you've all uh, written in the form, um, and it, it being different than any kind of research that is involved in, and in perhaps something that's nonfiction where you're not also maybe the subject. Um, uh, and I'm just wondering, maybe just more broadly about about what that what that looks like. Um, uh, as someone who's never written memoir before. Uh, I wouldn't know how to like begin. <laughs> like, I mean, I think you're excavating memory obviously. And, 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 but I just wonder, you know, in the, the process of revising the work of fiction or poetry or something like that, it, it involves like more creation right. um, and m more adding in um, stuff that's not there or new ideas come to you in the process of revision. And so I think of a lot of writing as, as revision, but, um, and that could be true in nonfiction too, when you're trying to tease out ideas, but when you're sort of dealing with the raw material of, of your own experience, mm -hmm. I'm just curious about that, that kind of process, um, which I guess one could call research in the process. It of is. A memoir. I, yeah, I think it is research. I mean, I was a diarist as <laughs> in my youth. So I reread a bunch of things, not only to, because you know, I don't trust that my eight-year-old self is always telling the truth, but to like remember who I was at eight years old and 11 years old. Uh, so that was part of it. Uh, in, in the book, there's also a description of um, my getting arrested uh, and uh, for felony retail theft for which I suffered no consequences. And my parents had a thick file with the, uh, with the tab Vermont. You know, sort of elusive reference to where I got in trouble, but <laughs> lest anyone raid their filing cabinet doesn't, didn't say anymore. Uh, so I reread like the notes they took about what happened and um, that paired with my own sort of diaries just filled in a lot of holes for me. So I do think the ways in which one can actually find material or, you know, like childhood videos, whatever is useful, but you know, also much relies on infallible memory. So Mira, the question John asked was about how memoirists conduct research, you know, when sort of you're the subject. I think that was, oh, yeah. I hope I'm not doing it at a disservice. No, yeah. And also just curious about, about I think of much of my own writing or, or when I speak to other writers about how much inventiveness comes from, um, the process of revision or editing um, and and just curious about what that looks like when you are trying to hew towards obviously you can you can still be creative within the memoir form about yourself memory is fungible in that way but how you still hew to those some sort of essential truth while you're making those discoveries that one makes uh, in the in the revision process just in the in the writing process the drafting process so that's such a good question that's a, Kira, do, Kira, did you also talk about that? Not yet. Not yet. Oh, go, go, go. I'm so curious about yours. Oh, um, I use a, a lot of photographs. I have so many. I reference journals and diaries. I, uh, like Courtney, I don't rely on them for truth because there's always the extra layer of who might read these diaries of when I'm 13 years old and, you know, also not understanding the realities around me um, and writing that version. But I would go to it for just basic, like what language and vocabularies I was accessing at certain ages. Um, I had 
a subscription to newspapers.com. So I was always reading and still do across genres. I would read the paper of the place I'm writing about in the time just to see what's going on. Uh, music, greatest hits of that year. Um, I'm always trying to build kind of a, like a mood board soundtrack for my project, no matter what it is, the songs, the colors, the textures, the news, everything. Um, so that helps just build the mood. Um, but all that said, I, I rely on emotional memory. Like I know what happened, even if I don't remember the color of the carpet in the room or some little detail. And I'm going to make that up if it means building the world so that you can access the scene to get to the emotional truth of what happened between the people in the scene. That's more important to me. Um, so I do create, to, to go back on your question, I don't think the process is so different than fiction or poetry. Um, I am creating a lot and I'm also um, completely creating in terms of thinking about like, what if I write a scene of a hypothetical scene, if this character did something else? Like I let people wander into the what ifs and I think that's still in the realm of nonfiction and still pretty interesting. So it's kind of both. I think that's so, I, I, um, I so agree with that. And also something someone told me once, which was very helpful to me about writing memoir is that it is so much about both looking back at what happened, but also imagining around the spaces, imagining around what you, what wasn't apparent to you in the moment, mm -hmm. kind of looking behind the corner and seeing what was there. And I feel like um, as a fiction writer as well, I feel like that's so accurate to me, the idea of like bringing yourself back to a moment, but, but, La allowing yourself to breathe into spaces you couldn't hold in that second mm -hmm. and allowing yourself to expand through them. Um, and I think doing that for me has just been, um, it sort of transformed the process of writing memoir, right? It sort of, it turned it into something that was, um, that a allowed me to just expand in a way that I didn't expect. I really, I thought, I thought memoir was going to constrain me. Um, and it does in some ways, but in other ways, I think there's a, there's an expansion there that people don't talk about nearly enough. Well, I do think the fact that all of us had fiction training was very helpful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because, you know, I, I think thinking in narrative terms instead of like feeling tethered to, I don't know. I think that expansiveness that comes from fiction writing has, you know, really useful application. I agree. Absolutely. We, we have time for one more question that maybe perhaps dovetails with what we're discussing and hopefully isn't too much of another meaty crafts question, but um, a viewer writes in that um, hearing this discussion reminded them that the, that the spilt milk is memoirs, a collection of, of, of memoir essays. And um, Mira, you've written a memoir in conversations. And so I'm wondering um, how, how there's now these various forms, collection form, um, uh, conversational forms that can lend to this process as well. Um, the viewer writes, how does that come about? So how do you decide from these sort of raw materials or, or perhaps the writings that you have before the book, how you're going to structure it? Um, this is always an interesting question too for, for, for any genre because um, uh, in poetry, there's often a lot of talk of like how you, you know, poets put all their pages out on a table and try to figure out how these things connect. Um, but you know, you're gonna have poems going into a poetry collection, memoir, you just have your life. How do, how do you decide the, the structure, a book length memoir versus this format versus that format? Mm. Wow, that's a great question. Courtney, do you have um, a way that you, a way that you did that? I do, I mean, it's an essay collection. Uh, and I think just the first part of your question was about like the sort of pluralization of that word. I think that was to uh, indicate that these are personal essays in part. Um, but I also think it's sort of a memoir in essays to the extent we want to go into subgenres. Uh, in that much like, you know, where our conversation started, it's a lot of sort of distinct subjects, but all through, seen through a single lens. Um, so I think it evokes that it's personal um, and it evokes that uh, they are united in that way. Uh, in terms of, you know, putting them together, it was a lot of trial and error for me, the opening essay, um, which is about my childhood anxiety and my child's anxiety, uh, always felt like the proper opening because I think there is um, 
a lot of anxiety in the in the book as a whole. Uh, and the closing essay, which is sort of about uh, astrology and systems that provide comfort and um, offer an antidote to you know existential anxieties, always seem like the natural sort of bookend. Uh, but in between, I played around a lot, um, mindful of endings and beginnings and how I wanted themes to develop. And also since I move around in time, mindful of um, what a reader may or may not need to know to enter this piece based on what I've already supplied. So yeah, I did have the pages on the floor um, and played a game of Tetris. <laughs> I bet. I bet. I mean, I bet that was part of just also just laying out which comes where was just a whole art form in itself. Yeah. Yeah. I, it was fun. But it, once I committed, I was like, no, you know, it's like, there's no in it. Yeah. But I, I feel like this is the right one. Yeah. I mean, the flow is really strong in there and it's really, it is really interesting because I did marvel at that because they are essays um, and because you did have to kind of pivot and pivot in different ways. Um, but yeah, the, the feeling of the cohesiveness is strong. Um, I'll very quickly just say that um, with mine, I wrote, uh, there were, I think, 40 something conversations that ended up on the page. I wrote probably 80. Um, and for me, it was just a matter of culling down. Um, and I, I kind of figured out the structure early on. So for me, it was just a matter of which conversations were the ones that I felt were most pressing, like which ones were the ones that were still stuck in my throat. And that meant that I had to put them out. What did you do with the ones that, you know, didn't make it in? Oh God. I mean, there's a whole sad section. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's like a whole made up conversation I had with Bill Murray that never made it in. Um, oh, that, I, that I sometimes still just read to myself because I oh, find it so funny. <laughs> I want that one, please. I know. Please send it to you. I want to send it to you guys after this. Please. Yeah, that should find an, another home somewhere. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've, we've reached the top of the hour. Um, Courtney Zoffness, congratulations on the publication of Spilt Milk, and thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations, Courtney. And thank you to Tiki Madden and Mira Jacob for joining us as well. And thank you to all of you for rolling through um, Xfinity and AT&T and Mediacom and all of our great uh, internet service providers, making this a little bit difficult, but still just an absolutely <laughs> wonderful conversation. Um, <laughs> And, and uh, we hope to, we can have you all in the store um, um, for future books uh, when it's safe to do so. But until then, we hope you continue to stay well. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us at Home with Literati. We hope you continue to stay safe and be well. And we'll see you at the next event. So take care, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. See you soon. Bye-bye.